It's Tuesday, November 29th, and they wish they were told about their water before they spent all day drinking it. We start here. Millions of Texans are told your water might not be safe. We shouldn't drink it. We shouldn't cook with it. We'll take it to Houston, where questions have been pouring in. Hawaii's biggest volcano is erupting. Big cloud of steam sulfur coming up in the center. My locals are hoping to say hello and goodbye quickly. And the Biden administration has pushed back student loan guidelines yet again. So what does it mean for you? How much authority does a president have? Can he, with the stroke of a pen, make big decisions? Forget deadlines. Some graduates still don't know how much they owe. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. most basic things a local government can do for its people is infrastructure, right? Roads, electricity, sewer lines, and of course, clean water. You lose any of those things and your people are immediately less safe. There have been instances in this country where running water has been tainted. Too often, it's marginalized communities that are hit hardest and longest. But rarely have we seen such a wide swath of Americans lose access to clean water all at once than in Houston this week. The water is not clean for us, and so we shouldn't drink it. We shouldn't cook with it. We shouldn't give it to ourselves to drink or even to our pets. With no natural disaster, no hurricane flooding these streets, Houston suddenly had to tell its 2.2 million residents, you can't trust what's coming out of your tap. You should be boiling your water. The local government now says it's gotten things more or less under control, but let's go straight to ABC's Maria Villarreal, who is there in Houston. Maria, can you just explain, first of all, how a city of 2 million people can suddenly lose access to clean water like this? What happened? So somehow the major water plant that basically is connected to all of the 21 locations around the city had a power outage. At plant one went offline due to a ground trip and current current overload. The electrical feeder from plant three also experienced a ground fault trip. And not only did it hit two major transformers, but then it also hit a backup as well. It caused a chain reaction in the city of Houston, and it affected at least 16 locations, 16 smaller water treatment facilities around the city. So there were a lot of people that were saying, well, listen, if this is the big you know, water treatment plant on one side of the city. Why do I have to start boiling my water? What they didn't realize is that one power outage at those two transformers really affected 16 treatment facilities around the city. And it forced them to basically take extra precautions and making sure nobody got sick. So the entire city had to go under this boil water notice. Pressure at 16 of those 21 sites dropped below the emergency regulatory level of 20 PSI. Because it fell under that 20 PSI, that triggered a whole lot of different things with the Texas Commission of Environmental Quality. They are the regulatory agency here in Texas, TCEQ, that makes sure you are following the rules. Once you get to that point, you set off this chain reaction. And in order to get back you know, to status quo with TCEQ in the state, it's going to take a solid 24 hours of sampling. Right. So they said we got this boil water notice is kind of mandatory. We'll turn it off soon. It looks like it's taking care of itself in the early morning hours here. Um, what was the reaction among Houston residents, though? This came so suddenly and it was so vast. You know, as soon as I landed here in Houston this morning, we immediately started to talk to residents. And also, I mean, just walking through the airport, you saw water fountains that were, you know, they had plastic all over them. You went into the bathrooms and there was bags over the over the sinks. And we kind of considered this as an emergency because everyone needs water. It's Houston. We got to be prepared for everything. Snow water, whatever. Also, we've spoken with business owners that have said, listen, I mean, luckily we were able to get, you know, filtered water in here that we provided on our own, but the city wasn't providing filtered water because they didn't feel like this was a big enough incident for them to have to provide that for any businesses, residents. Well, I didn't know till nine o'clock at night last night, so... And thank God for Instagram. A lot of people were saying, listen, um, when did this happen? Oh, it happened in the morning. Well, good to know that the boil water notice came out at about 6 p.m. at night mm. when I'd already gone to the bathroom and brushed my teeth and made dinner and, you know, made lunch and done, did all these things during the day. 
and you didn't tell me until so many hours later. So I think, look, there was a lot of frustration from the residents about when the boil water notice came down. That we are doing a, a complete diagnostic assessment uh, to, to based on what happened. Uh, to see how can we mitigate it from happening again. The city basically said, you know, by the afternoon on Sunday, we were trying to notify residents, but our system wasn't fast enough. And that is something we also need to, one, apologize for, but two, we need to work on that because it needs to happen faster. Yeah, we've seen issues with Texas power specifically in the past. We remember that huge power outage in the middle of a winter in which people were literally freezing in their homes. Mayor Sylvester Turner there in Houston says this is not that. This is a quick power outage. However, big stakes whenever you're talking about this basic infrastructure. Uh, Maria Villarreal there in Houston. Thanks so much. Thanks, Brad. There was no huge natural disaster that should have disrupted life in Houston, but in Hawaii right now, you'd probably go right into emergency mode if you looked out your window and saw this. The sky is red as which means that the volcano is flowing. It's just crazy how you can clearly see that that's lava coming down. The largest active volcano in the world is on the big island of Hawaii. It's called Mauna Loa. It hadn't erupted in nearly 40 years until yesterday. ABC's chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, is following this. Matt, this sounds scary. What's going on in Hawaii right now? You know, Brad, when we talk about active volcano, we're talking about geological terms, right? So 40 years is, you know, a fraction, is an eye blink in geological terms. So it's been pretty recent. And this is a sizable eruption. It has been anticipated. You know, we're way overdue. We were way overdue for a monolithic eruption. There have been all of these little quakes around yeah, the volcano uh, over the past several multiple weeks. Mauna Loa is more likely to erupt out of periods of heightened unrest than it is when it's completely quiet. And just to give context, we're talking about the biggest active volcano on the planet. Most of the big island of Hawaii comprises this volcano. It goes way down into the water. And essentially, the volcano, what's above sea level and below sea level, is the tallest mountain on the planet. So mm. this is big. And if it does erupt in a major way, that is obviously or could obviously be catastrophic for anybody living in anywhere near it. We don't want to try and second guess the volcano. We have to let it actually show us what it's going to do and then we inform people of what is happening ASAP. We could be in for a little bit of a prolonged time trying to determine if this is going to be a, a, a summit only eruption. Pretty sizable uh, eruption at this point, not massive. We're not talking about, you know, 4,000 foot plumes or even higher plumes. Um, but this could mean that more is on the way or as mm. uh, volcanologists like to tell me, it could mean nothing at all. What does it look like there? That, like I'm trying to imagine how this would affect everyday life there for residents. You know, we're not talking about Min Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, you know, that blew its top and, mm -hmm. and the 30,000 foot column of ash and lava and lightning that's being generated. This is kind of the regular eruption that happens, uh, which actually makes for spectacular views. We came down to uh, Cabo Bay to get a really good view of the glow of Mauna Loa erupting right now at Volcanoes National Park. If you're in Hilo or even on the other side, the sky was painted this, this bright red. And then at sunrise, it was these hues of, of purple and magenta. It was quite beautiful. You can tell that's lava even through the camera. It's crazy. Closer up, helicopters have done these flybys, and you're able to see this ribbon of fire across the landscape of the horizon. Big cloud of steam, sulfur coming up in the center. Gas is starting to bubble up. Some of these are noxious gases that have erupted, so they are telling people on the Big Island to watch out, to wear masks if they're going to go outside. People with respiratory problems should stay indoors. Right now, this is not a threat to either homes or people. I'm kind of slang with this. I'm kind of okay with this. And if you talk to people on the island, they're not too concerned. In fact, they're kind of excited because they've gotten to see these incredible images and, and bright lights and sunrises and sunsets uh, because of this eruption. Listen to the cokey frogs. Look at the sky. Look at my pretty face. Slay. <sighs> 
remember in 2018, and you and I talked then, there was this persistent eruption in Kilauea, which had these fissures, which gurgled lava into these communities, destroying uh, 700 homes at the time, creating uh, almost 900 new acres of land. Wow. That's not the case now. It's not right underneath a town or a community. It's pretty distant. It's 13,600 feet up. Um, this is the, the mountain that has erupted before. There are no homes near it. But it could get worse, and obviously seismologists and volcanologists are really looking out, as are civil defense officials in Hawaii. All right, and that government has covered many of these before. I've seen you running around too close to the lava, Matt, so none of that this time, please. Thank you so much. I won't, Brad. I'll be safe. Next up on Start Here, I don't care if you majored in math or not. Everyone's confused about student loans right now. That's after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's Bring how you start your, your day, people. Zoo. 200. Oh, 200. 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the music. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! this mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. This is the Lil Wayne you know. Make some noise for this foreigner. Hey, this is the Lil Wayne you don't know. Who is Lil Wayne in 2022? Oh. Uh. This is Impact by Nightline. You have to stop, take a minute, breathe, look back and reflect and all that to actually feel something. I don't know how to do that. Now streaming only on Hulu. Friday, 2020 True Crime. A 15-year-old girl taken by a 50-year-old man. No one could believe it. Do you think he preyed on you? He did. And he manipulated me. Friday night, exclusive new interviews with those closest to the case. He did, at one point, blame the devil. And the stunning police interview never before seen. 2020. That explosive secret was about to be revealed. Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. Hello, hello. <laughs> Hi. Tonight. <laughs> Come to laugh, come to feel loved, and learn secrets of one of the most loved Christmas movies of all time. Love actually is... And how did Hugh answer? Oh, dead. 
<laughs> Dead. It's the secrets of Love Actually you don't know. The love stories that came from real life. Love Actually is not just positive love. <laughs> there was real legitimate heartache in that movie. Oh, and the dance that almost didn't happen. You guys saw it in the script and I thought, well, I'll hate doing that. And now lives on today across TikTok. The laughter and secrets of Love Actually, 20 years later. Genius. <laughs> A Diane Sawyer special, tonight at 8, 7 central on ABC. Earlier this month, you probably remember a couple of federal courts putting the brakes on President Biden's plan to cancel big chunks of student loan debt for millions. I'm never going to apologize for helping working class and middle class families recover from the economic crisis created by the pandemic. This was a problem for the White House for a couple of reasons. One, this is literally a life-changing amount of money for lots of families, and the White House is worried what will happen to people who don't get this assistance. Two, and perhaps even more pressingly, the White House had already said people would have to resume paying student loans they do have at the end of this year. That moratorium on student loan payments was being lifted. Well, last week, in the wake of this court ruling, the Biden administration changed course and once again extended that moratorium. So what does this all mean? Let's Let's bring in ABC's Ann Flaherty, who covers federal agencies. And Ann, let's just get this figured out first, please. Like, if you have a student loan at this moment, you haven't had to pay it down for the last couple of years, interest has been halted. When do you have to start paying it again at this point? Oh, this is the worst possible answer I, I realize that I can give to people because everybody wants certainty. And the, the real answer is nobody really knows. So what the moratorium says is 60 days after litigation is resolved. I should add no later than June 30th, 2023. Although that date I don't. I wouldn't even put too much stock in that date because that date, uh, you know, the, the administration could just extend it further after that point. I mean, what they're doing is they're trying to give time for the Supreme Court to weigh in. We, we've had these multiple lawsuits. Everything's gotten so convoluted. You have you know different judges, conservative judges, weighing in and saying there's no way that the administration has the power to do this. Uh, the administration says we absolutely do. We we think we're very confident that we have this ability. So they've gone directly to the Supreme Court and said, will you take this on? We think this is important. We don't want to leave 40 million people in limbo. The Department of Justice is asking the Supreme Court of the United States to rule on the case. And the Supreme Court you know, has not weighed in yet. They have said that they think the block on the program should stand. But it isn't fair to ask tens of millions of borrowers eligible for relief to resume their student debt payments while the courts consider the lawsuit. So that means that, that reason, loan forgiveness can't go out the door um, for now until this is resolved in the courts. So we're waiting on, on the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, for example, to make a decision. And we're waiting for a possible decision by the Supreme Court to take this on, in which case they could make a, a ruling next year at some point in spring or in summer in June, for example, and say, this is going to be how it's going to go. And then that's when the moratorium would be lifted. Wait, so the loan forgiveness is the thing that's being tied up in the courts. The Biden administration is basically saying the moratorium is linked to the forgiveness, that we will figure that out when the courts figure out the big debt forgiveness thing. We just have no idea when that's going to get figured out. That would be exactly it. And, you know, the reason why that is so frustrating to the administration is that they wanted to lift this pause on repayments by January. But it takes six weeks or so for them to look at these applications and say, OK, you qualify and you don't. So what happens when the courts throw a wrench in this and say, nope, you can't do this? Um, and you were planning on resuming payments in January. That means some people will qualify for this program and will have to resume payments on money that the government has told them they shouldn't pay back. Right, because it's not just like, when do I need to plan out my interest rates and stuff? You're thinking like, do I have $25,000 of debt that I'm paying off or do I have $5,000 of debt that I'm paying off? Like, what, you don't even know that. Right, right. And so what we're hearing, uh, you know, anecdotally, people are getting these emails and they're saying, oh, you know, congratulations, you've been approved for this program. You qualify for loan forgiveness. This is $10,000 if you make up to $125,000 a year. 
um, or 250 if, as a couple. Um, you get even more money forgiven if you're a Pell Grant recipient, $20,000. Um, but by the way, we can't give that to you because everything is tied up in the courts because America is an incredibly litigious country and we're just going to fight this in the courts. So just hang tight. And I can imagine how absolutely frustrating that is. But, you know, this is a debate that goes back for years about, you know, how much authority does a president have? Can he, with the stroke of a pen, make big decisions, whether it's going into war or whether it's forgiving student loan debt? All of this hinges on, you know, what is executive authority and did he overstep his bounds? I feel like I'm going to get hate mail from people who do owe student loans, but I have this question because at this point, I'm trying to figure out even why the moratorium exists, right? The idea that you can stop paying loans without any interest accruing. Because originally it made sense because the pandemic was throwing everyone's jobs into chaos. Like if you're a 25-year-old bartender and the bar has shut down, how can you be expected to pay? And at this point, President Biden is going around saying the pandemic is over. He's saying the economy's improving, that like, don't worry too much about jobs and inflation. I got it under control. So what is the rationale for the moratorium, regardless of what happens with the student? Is the idea just sorry, student loans are too hard to pay? We're not going to make you anymore? Well, and so this gets into a much deeper, deeper question. I mean, you're absolutely right. When this uh, pause on student loan payments came, it was this is when we were evacuating people off of cruise ships. That's how early it was. It was three years ago. Um, so, yes, everything has changed. Nobody thinks that the pandemic is in the stage that it was before. I, I, what has changed is the politics. Biden is under an extraordinary amount of pressure to fix this really just intractable problem that he's had, that government has had, uh, really since the student loan program began. It's very unfair to people who took other pathways in life that didn't require them to take out a lot of loans. So maybe people that went into business immediately, people that went into trades. The government is in the business of providing loans to people as a way of, of advancing their you know, station in life to be able to improve themselves and go to college, which is a good thing. Um, but the reality is, is that college has gotten too expensive. The, the price points have just gotten so high, and it doesn't always pay back. Maybe the university should be responsible uh, for that. If they're producing people, they went deep into debt, and their degree is not worth anything, and they're not able to make enough money to pay it back, uh, well, then that's on them. And so at the same time that we've expanded these student loans, we haven't reined in a lot of these college programs, particularly for-profit colleges that have really exploited these people. And so you have a lot of people who have debt that they quite simply cannot pay back. So, you know, Democrats under pressure to want to do something, to rein this in, to change the situation. You know, this, I think, is one step of a much, much bigger problem, which is, you know, the federal government being involved in this loan system that isn't really working. Yeah, we've actually seen just in the last couple of weeks, several big name companies, Google is one of them, to say we're no longer going to say bachelor degree required for some of these positions because what is a college degree exactly? And, and is it possible to have applicants who are fully qualified who might not necessarily have wanted to pay all these student loans to go to school? Uh, Ann Flaherty, really helpful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. And one last thing. We are currently undefeated in this tournament. We haven't lost yet. A lot of Americans don't like the concept of a game ending in a tie. Win, win or go home, right? Win or go home. Well, you've got your wish, because today at the World Cup, the U.S. men's national team has to win or go home. It's that simple. Christian Pulisic now takes it off the top of the crossbar. The U.S. draw against England on Black Friday was the most watched soccer game in American history. Across Fox and Telemundo, it averaged 20 million viewers. But because it ended in a draw, it forces the U.S. into a must-win game against Iran. And as if there wasn't already enough geopolitical tension there, the U.S. Soccer Federation injected even more into it this weekend. In their own nod of support, U.S. soccer altered the flag of Iran on a social media post. See, in a Twitter graphic, the U.S. soccer account put the U.S. and Iranian flags next to each other. However, that Iranian flag was missing the seal in the center, that red symbol representing the Islamic Republic regime. Perhaps not something a ton of Americans would even notice, but this was a huge deal to Iran. Uh, to pursue this through FIFA's morality committee, they must be held responsible. At first, some people weren't even sure this was done on purpose. Maybe some intern grabbed an old image of the flag. But then U.S. soccer confirmed they had done it on purpose to support Iranian protesters. 
The intent of the post was to show support for women's rights. Uh, it was meant to be a moment. Which, fine, if that's what you want to do. Only thing was, players made it clear they had nothing to do with this. Are you, were you aware of it before I just brought it up now? No, that's correct. We didn't know about it uh, till now. So suddenly, they're being asked questions about the state of Iran. The captain was lectured on his pronunciation. You're pronouncing our country's name wrong. Our country is named Iran, not Iran. Please, once and for all, let's get this clear. Leading some to wonder whether players had been accidentally forced into the role of ambassadors before the biggest game of their lives. U.S. soccer actually took the post down, which is the latest instance of Western nations backing off from social stances at this tournament. A pointed protest from the German starting 11, each of them covering their mouths in response to FIFA's demand that their players not wear that anti-discrimination, one-love rainbow armband. Remember, the host nation of Qatar was chosen by FIFA to host this tournament, despite the fact that being gay is against the law there. Like, if you're a gay player or a gay fan, you have to hide it. Several European team captains announced they were taking a stand by wearing special armbands supporting LGBTQ rights. But... They backed down when tournament organizers said they could be suspended from matches. Meanwhile, Iranian players aren't just worried about yellow cards. If they take a stance on the protest engulfing their home country, they face severe repercussions when they return. But that didn't stop their captain from saying out loud he supports these protesters. It didn't stop his whole team from refusing to sing the national anthem in their first game. And it didn't stop a protester yesterday from running on the field with a rainbow flag before being taken into custody by authorities. There are social media stances and there are real life confrontations. Some protesters fighting for freedom are saying, just like on the field later today, a draw is just as bad as a loss. Obviously a lot of off the field stuff happening, but man, starting at 2 p.m. Eastern today, I'm going to be sweating it out, man. We, we had to move our daily meeting later today just because I'll be a mess this whole afternoon watching this young U.S. team, affectionately known as the Baby Eagles, by the way, which I love, as they take the field against Iran. More on all these stories at abcnews.com and the ABC News app. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It's lunchtime in America. So what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like your health, your money, breaking news, exclusives, pop culture, and with the biggest stars, music, trends, style, and some laughs and some good food. You got me feeling like... You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm going to 